This was the little alley that I grew up in Guadalupe, and um, I was just there actually yesterday. Every time I come back to the Philippines, I make it the most to go visit our neighborhood. It's a humbling reminder about the journey that I've gone through. And little did I know, this is also the neighborhood with so much love. We live literally next door to each other, so it's a very loving community where we live. Like, really, like it's not adorable next door. Every day, and little did I know, this is also the place where I would have an intersection of my identity. At five years old, my mom asked me, "How come I always wear that T-shirt in my head?" I said, "Mom, I'm a girl. This is my hair." At 15 years old, I, start, I started joining transgender beauty pageants. I think we all know this is a culture that we all love and celebrate in the Philippines. And it's one of those cultures that, when I travel around the world, it's so important for me to highlight how proud I am of this culture. This culture allowed me to celebrate who I am, to be really thinking about who I really am. Because of that, I was able to become a model that I am. I had always dreamed to become a model, and somehow that training and joining beauty pageants and fiesta celebrations from the city to the province, to right, uh, right pad is beautiful pad, and allowed me to just be in tune about my artistic self. And being a model, for me, is my creative expression. And then, I had the opportunity to give a TED Talk. It's definitely one of the most critical moments in my life where it was very scary. It's one of those things that you're so aware, you're so conscious about what you're about to do. It's a box that the moment you open, there's no way of closing it. But it also allowed me to, to do the work that I'm doing right now. After we launched that talk, I launched Gender Proud. What's interesting is when I was thinking of sharing my story to the world, I wanted it to mean something, not just about coming out. I'm taking a big risk in my career, in my life, so I wanted to mean something. And the story with Gender Proud is a very personal story. In 2005, I was traveling from New York to Tokyo with my Philippine passport that was passed a male name and male gender marker. Next thing I know, I was in Narita Airport. Two immigration officers were next to me. They took me aside inside the immigration holding office. They asked me the most dehumanizing question about who I am, almost why I am. So I go back in that story and why I launched Gender Proud. And then the part is two things. First, the advocacy piece, which this is a three focused country. What we're advocating for is the single gender recognition law. It is a law that allows transgender and gender marker, uh, gender varying people to change names and gender marker on legal documents without being forced to go through surgery. Not a lot, there's only a handful of countries that allow you to do that. In the Philippines, there's no law at all for you to change that. So Brazil has, to, has now legislation that proposed specifically about gender recognition law. It's a very it's a very progressive law that allows people to just fully self-identify. You announce this is who you are, and nobody has the right to tell you that you have to go to surgery. You need to go to all these barriers and bureaucracies and process just to affirm who you really are. In Hong Kong, there is now um, a case that's now being presented. A trans man specifically challenging the law in Hong Kong, specifically 
saying that I don't need to have my top surgery before I can take my name and gender marker. Philippines so a little interesting story. Currently, there's an anti discrimination bill that's now in the House of Congress. It's an anti discrimination bill that would protect LGBT people, that would protect sexual orientation and gender identity. It's also this is on the front line, just know this works very well. So, these are the three focus countries, and we do awareness work where we tell different stories, dignified and empowering stories about the Chinese experience. Are you guys seeing this? <laughs> this is a very pivotal moment. I was actually in Manila last May, and this is, this happened. I was here, and it's such a pivotal moment where finally, this is big. For anybody who has a transgender experience, people who have gender nonconformity, I can't tell you enough how, how big this is. For the first time, they've recognized, and they even said, that the transgender movement is the next civil rights movement. I dare to say that the, the thing that I forgot to the dimension is this is a civil rights movement that's happening within a globalized, technologically connected world. So basically, when I post something on my Facebook and I talk about my gender rights, someone from the Philippines is saying that Facebook post. So I have a following. And what happens is that person, a transgender person here in the Philippines, is realizing, how come I can't have those rights? I'm a human being, I'm a transgender woman. It doesn't mean that because I live in the United States, I get to have those rights. These are human dignity. We're talking about human dignity. And they still don't have any borders. Because of the time I think, however, there's a lot of very grassroots movement that's happening. A lot of the communities are using technology to change the dynamics and conversation and empowering the community. This is one perfect example. This is hashtag growth by us. If you guys have not followed it, this is so important. This is probably one of the, the one of the first hashtags that really empowered the community. This hashtag allows transgender and gender non-conforming people to share their story. People from all over the world are sharing their lived experience, the discrimination that they're experiencing. There's another one called hashtag what trans looks like. What's happening is I know my privilege. I get to speak with you all. I get to travel around the world. As a fashion model, I get that platform to talk about these things. But I'm one of the lucky ones. What this hashtag does when you go to what trans looks like, it's really humanized the story for people. These are transgender people from Alabama. These are transgender people from Ipagal province. These are the people that covers the range of the transgender experience. This is another powerful platform that's happened in the United States called Trans 100. This year, I was lucky enough to be invited as a curator. Basically, what's happening is we uh, selected 100, 100 trans and gender non-conforming people that are doing important advocacy work all over the United States. These are people that are doing human rights work in the middle of Birmingham, Alabama, but they're doing it. So I have no excuse to not do it because people have limited resources that are doing it. This is a very powerful platform called Transform. Basically, it's a hackathon from all over the United States. There's about six cities that have done that already. What they do is they, they create tough products to empower the community and figure out how we could really use uh, open source technology to create change and create a dialogue and what it means to, to be transgender and be human. So, last May, I had the opportunity to travel back to the Philippines. It was a big welcome home. We had the trans Santa Cruz and I was the queen with my own camera film. In Captain City, it was fun. So, this is home for me. Being back here in the Philippines, this is the culture that I love. So what's happening, I met so many people that are doing important work. This woman right here, I think she's here right now, Disney Aguilar. Disney started an organization called Trans Death Philippines. Think about that for a second. Talk about marginalized communities. She stepped up and figured out a way to create a voice for her community. What's also interesting that's happening, I remember this conversation that we're having and just doing the sign language. And the thing that I kept on noticing is she kept on doing this, this thing, you know, the two hands. You know, in the, in the United States, I watch a lot of Will and Grace, and it usually means 
just Jack or Jacqueline. What it actually means is wonderful. So when you think or hear something wonderful, do out. Think about this thing in her community, what they're doing. This is the people that are very resourceful. Another thing what she's doing and using social media and technology, when she started her organization, she's using open source technology like Facebook and asking people what logo should I use in my organization. I mean, talking about really figuring it out and not letting people just tell her what to do. Very inspiring woman. This is another controversial social media hashtag that's happening. I don't know if you guys saw this. It's hashtag my genitalia has nothing to do with my gender identity. This woman named Maki Vignano, she's from Tibu, basically what happened, she was applying for a gym membership in Tibu, and she was basically not allowed to go in the women's facility because she had not had the operation. People think that she's not a woman. She believes that she's a woman, she presents as a woman, she lives her life as a woman, she took the right to be. And this is not like a woman. And this is the important conversation that we, we need to have. This is the nuanced conversation. But what it means to have this diverse branch of experience as a woman. I think this summarizes really what is the context in the Philippines. Being LGBT in the Philippines is culturally celebrated, if not politically recognized. It's time for us to have these conversations. We all have gay friends, lesbian friends, transgender friends. The next time you see them, look at them in the eye and ask them, have a real conversation with them. What are their dreams? It's the same dream that you have. You just want to pursue that truth that we all know within ourselves. And what's also important, you know, I, I kept on joking around this with friends. I think the next TED talk that I want to give is I want to come out again. I think I want to come out again as a positive anthropologist. I just love anthropology so much. And these images summarize gender fluidity, specifically in Asian cultures. Any old civilization, gender fluidity is born. People have this. Transgender people are actually revered. And your top left, this is the Babylon ceremony. The Babylon, if you guys don't know, is the actually considered free and spiritual teachers before um, Spanish came to the Philippines. On your top right, this is Balikara Mata. This is, uh, this is the um, Hijra goddess for um, people that believe that people who live in India, this is their goddess. This is gender fluid people, and Hijra, the transgender people in India, actually believe. You know, every time there's a wedding, they're, they're, man, they're mandatory to be in the wedding because they're believed to bring luck in the, in the marriage. The, on the bottom left, it's this goddess, which I just thought they're going to have a tattoo up for some time. It's Guan Yin, the Buddhist goddess of compassion. Think about that for a moment. The core tenets of Buddhism. Compassion. Their goddess is Guan Yin. She's a transgender woman. She's believed that because she's experienced both gender, she understands the suffering of the human kind, and she has so much compassion around the world. At the bottom right, this is the, the ceremony called the Two Spirits. This is the Native American um, ceremony. I remember having this um, interview in the United States with a woman named Alicia Menendez, and she asked me, why do you think it's not culturally celebrated in the United States, the gender fluidity? I just basically said, well, the United States that we know it's only 200 years old. This existed in the United States for such a long time, even way before any colonized nations came in. And what is happening now? Let's talk about action. This is what's happening now. This is so important. The anti-discrimination bill is now in the House of Congress. It's co-sponsored by Congresswoman Kakabag Al. It's important to understand that it protects people. People that just want to exist as they are. So what's happening now in the national conversation about legislation, the activist groups all over the Philippines are mobilizing. They're using grassroots um, um, organizing. So currently there is about 10.4% 10, 10 of the population in the Philippines are protected. There are seven cities that have anti-discrimination ordinance, and there's two problems. You know, the most recent one is Sandon City in Ilocos uh, Sur, that has a population of 57,884. This is uh, the data 
infographic that's um, compiled by um, University of Open Institute for Population. This is another nuanced conversation. I think it is a disaster for the society to not understand it. I was a fine boy at birth. I don't believe I was a boy at boy. It's time for us to have this nuanced conversation about what it means about gender assignment. You know, when you're born, because of your birth certificate, you're just male or female. But sometimes that gender assignment doesn't matter. And this is the full reality of that. I lived my truth. At such a young age, I knew I was different. I just wanted to pursue that truth. And this is the type of conversation that we should have. You should never say you were born a girl or a boy. You're a fine gender at birth. And all of this work that we're doing, all of this work that I get to travel around the world, I do this. The activist community all do this for the future of the trans youth, not just in the Philippines, but all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.